Lisa Duan is here. She is an actor who is performing three short one-woman plays written by Samuel Beckett. Not I, Footfalls, and Rockabye are all late works written by the great Irish playwright. Ben Brantley has written, Ms. Duan doesn't just uncover layers, she digs all the way to the void between them. Yes, she speaks Beckett's text like a violin virtuoso playing Paganini, but she also listens and insists that we listen to the quiet that surrounds them. It is a silence so profound that it feels like eternity. Not I, Footfalls, and Rockabilly are playing at the Brooklyn Academy of Music through October 12th. I am pleased to have Lisa Duan at this table. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my pleasure, uh, and Beckett's pleasure, <laughs> <laughs> to have you there doing what you were doing. How did this come about? First, your own life circle in terms of you uh, being introduced to Beckett. Sure. Well, I started off uh, my life as a dancer. I was a ballet dancer. Went to England on a ballet scholarship, danced with the London Lewis Ballet Company, and then knee injuries led me to fall into acting. And I did lots, countless TV series in Ireland, right. the American TV series, and and then I was acting in this one series with an actor who was part of the Gate project, where they were committing um, all of Beckett's plays to film, and that was my landscape and my bar when I came to theatre. Um, and I, I was just, I was completely taken. Do you know what it was? Yeah, I think Beckett doesn't preach. We spoke about um, Pinter, Harold right. Pinter's fondness for Beckett, and he, he has. And they this, were friends. And they were very good friends. And you know, he's not standing over you with his hand over his heart. He's not trying to sell you anything. He's not being sentimental. Mm -hmm. And thus, there's an awful lot of space to come to. Um, as a viewer, you know, you're invited to bring your own landscape. And as an actor, I mean, it's just so vast. These characters are, are more like creatures. They're a slice of life. And that's a very expansive landscape to be given. Um, and the first opportunity you had was? Well, a couple of years later, I was sent a script of Not I, yeah. which is written like music. And I had heard about Not I. I'd heard that there's this play where there's a, a disembodied mouth eight foot above the stage in an entirely blackened out auditorium that appears to osculate or move across the auditorium because of the sensory deprivation. The human mind can't lock it to anything. And so each member of the audience has a completely unique experience in that darkness where they see this mouth roam. And Beckett wanted this text to be spoken at the speed of thought, to play on the nerves of the audience and not the intellect. And when I got this script, it's written like music. You've got these three dots interrupting this beautiful poetry. Um, so it's hard to speak it so fast because you do want to kind of stop and enjoy this, this beautiful imagery, the language, the humour. But I didn't hear just one stream of consciousness. I heard a kind of cacophony. Uh, I heard the nuns. I heard acerbic parochial asides. I heard the streets of Ireland. I heard home. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I was cast. Roll tape. Out! Into this world, this world, tiny little thing before its time and a god for what? Girl, yes, tiny little girl, into this, out into this before her time, god forsaken, whole, cold, cold, no matter, parents unknown, unheard of, he having vanished, thin air, no sooner buttoned of his breeches, she similarly eight months later, almost at the tick, so no love, spared that, no love such as normally vented on the speechless infant in the home, no, nor indeed for that matter any of any kind, no love of any kind at any subsequent stage, so typical affair, nothing of any note till coming up to sixty when, what, seventy, good god, Coming up to 70, wandering in a field, looking aimlessly for cowslips to make a ball. A few steps then, stop, stare into space, then on a few more, stop and stare again, so on. Drifting around when suddenly, gradually, all went out. All that early April morning light, and she found herself in the what? Who? No, she! found herself in the dark, and if not exactly insentient, insentient, for she could still hear the buzzing so-called in the ears, and a ray of light came and went, came and went, such as the moon might cast, drifting in and out a cloud, but so dulled, feeling, feeling so dulled, she did not know what position she was in, imagine, what position she was in, whether standing or sitting with the brain, what, kneeling, yes, with the standing, sitting or kneeling with the brain, what, lying, yes, with the standing, sitting, kneeling or lying with the brain, still, still in a way, for her first thought was, oh, long after, a sudden flash brought up as she had been to believe with the other waves in a merciful <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the mouthful. <laughs> yes, it is. And you know what I was listening to? I was listening for your breathing, see, when you breathe. Mm. And that, I mean, how do you, 
How do you do make the decision about breath and that? Oh God, I've no time to think about when I'm going to breathe. So I think I circular breathe. Yeah. Um, or just take little gasps whenever I can. But I think if I was to start thinking about breathing on top of everything else, I'd then hyperventilate you, and have yes, a panic yeah. attack. <laughs> uh, the decision to bring these three to uh -huh. New York. Mm -hmm. Your decision or some producer's decision? Yeah, I I always yeah. had it. Um, you know, Not I was first performed in New York in right. 1972 by Jessica Tandy. Oh, and the great Jessica Tandy. Yeah, and uh, Beckett went backstage because she did it in 22, 23 minutes and he said, you've destroyed my play. And then he wrote to Alan Schneider and said, I'm going to direct Billy Whitelaw in this myself and find out if it's theatre or not. And he kept saying to Billy, you know, you can't go fast enough. I want this at the speed of thought. And um, she got um, the, the piece down to maybe 14 minutes. Yeah. But she had several breakdowns trying to learn it. And in many respects, I'm breakdowns? only... Yeah. I'm only able to do it because... Um, well, Billy did. By performing it, she broke a big psychological barrier, almost like Roger Bannister in yeah, the Four, four Minute Mile. mile. Yeah. You know? And so I, I'm very grateful to her. And Billy became my mentor. But is, is it in part a physical thing as well? Well, in order to stay in this pin prick of light right. that just lights my lips, it's necessary for my whole body and my head to be fastened into a head harness. So I've got black makeup from here oh. to my chest, then a blindfold and then a pair of tights over my head. And I'm put into a hole in, in a piece of wood that only takes a third of my face and then my head is strapped in two places and uh, my arms are put into brackets and I'm just pressed against oh this God. piece of wood and then I obviously go like the clappers. Uh, talking about these three plays, I think it was Charles Spencer said, they are A, located at the very brink of death, that undiscovered country after Beckett and characters often yearn for. Hmm. Well, well, tell me about that. Well, it's one of the wonderful things about Beckett is this kind of universal landscape. Looking at footfalls, it was a big challenge. I mean, I think in many respects, not I is a representation of thought. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's boundaryless. I think that's why it provokes so many panic attacks in the audience. Um, I think it, uh, it speaks to people's core. Do, um, do these three compare to Waiting for Godot? Well, this is late Beckett. It, it and, late, very late. Yeah, thing about and what I, what I find interesting about late Beckett is that he's really starting to shake off Joyce's influence. That verbosity, that jocular kind of playfulness, which is funny, and, you know, I, I, I'm less attracted to it now as I've really looked at what I think is pure Beckett, where he distilled and distilled and pared away all the fat until you're left with something really potent, this real potent essence. Um, and not I is so lean and so tight, it really gets people in the jugular. With footfalls, among other things, it's like a chamber piece of music, and Beckett really writes like music. Um, there's so many elements to it, but I suppose broadly speaking, it's uh, an exploration of trauma, of oppression. It's usually played by two actresses. I play both roles, mother off stage and May pacing outside her mother's dying room. And I suppose we all carry these kind of traumas in our heads, don't we? Mm. And often we are our own oppressors. And it's been quite interesting to play both roles and, mm. uh, and that balance. Here is Sir Trevor Nunn talking about the genius of Beckett. Here it is. Beckett's absolutely unique, isn't he? I mean, um, a number of times I've read a short story by Beckett, and it isn't really a short story, it's a prose poem. And in, in the English language, the great tradition is, is um, verse drama, heightened language, the, 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 the use of language as a, a, as a very rich ingredient. And Beckett does exactly that in his own very special way. Um, even, it, it, even though sometimes the plays are very short, uh, even though the expression um, is, uh, is very limited, 
um, the selection of language, the rhythm of language, uh, the resonance of the language is absolutely extraordinary. And that, you, you find the echo of that in, in Harold Pinter. Um, the, the, the use of silence, mm. the use of stillness, and then just the one phrase that, that devastates you. Somebody I, I, I heard lecturing about Beckett said something that I, 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 I think is a thing of genius, that uh, somebody in the audience was complaining that, um, that Beckett can seem to be so pessimistic. And this lecturer said, um, I think in Beckett there is a pessimism that makes optimism look like sentimentality. Oh, I thought that was yeah. devastating, that's and I think that's, that, that's the illumination we get from him. Exactly what you were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Mm -hmm. He really relies that sentimentality is the language of gangsters, emotional yeah. gangsters. Um, and that's what makes the work so persuasive. Yes, it's hard and bleak and all of that, but... You know, I suppose, without sounding too pretentious, it's the closest thing to a kind of truth that I've ever, I've ever felt. And I think when I see audiences' responses, you know that it works for that reason. Of these three, do you like one more than the other? I think I'm beginning to understand uh, footfalls. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people say that it's probably the, the most difficult of all of Beckett's work. But I think I'm really starting to understand it in a very deep, visceral and personal way. Um, and in order to do that, I have to bring in my own landscape. Beckett's um, mother was May. That's right. In the character pacing outside the room. Mm -hmm. Is May. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, Beckett's mother is everywhere. Really? Particularly through all the... It was, it was fraught. fraught. She considered him fraught. to be... Yeah, <laughs> uh, maladjusted. And um, that was a real wound. And he said to Walter Asmus towards the end of his life, who's my director, um, you know, maybe I should have, maybe I should have been an accountant. And he didn't, he, he wasn't, you know, uh, being glib. No, I know. He, he felt he'd failed his mother. Um, In other words, maybe I should have been an accountant because I'm not what my mother wanted, wanted me, to, me be to be as a writer. Yeah. And it was hard for him. I mean, he was a genius. He couldn't toe the line. You know, um, he left a, a decent position in Trinity College. He didn't and, want to go the easy route no, either. No, he took the difficult route. Now, he was a very courageous writer. You know, mm. he had work rejected. It was interesting reading his letters, which are about to be published, the third volume, some of his rejection letters. You know, I suppose it gives us all hope to think. I always love when they publish letters just to see the mind at work and to see how they... Are Beckett's letters that interesting? Mm. They are. Um, you really realise he's honing a lot of the repetition. He keeps talking about um, uh, the unnameable, um, and uh, I'm working on this text, the unnameable, and he must write the same thing to um, about 20. The third one is Rockabye. Yeah. Uh, Billy Whitelaw said, a drive towards death. Mm. And it really is a drive. When I was rehearsing Rockabye with Walter Rasmus, um, he wouldn't let me get past the first six lines. He kept pulling me back, and... Uh, I was, I was fit to punch him by <laughs> the end of a week and we were still at these six lines. And then one day, he just let me go. And I felt like a glider. And, you know, we spoke about the music of Beckett's work. I really felt like I caught this current, this rhythm mm -hmm. that just took me, despite myself, towards the end of the piece. And I really felt like I needed that rhythm and... Um, to help me face one of the greatest, deepest, most painful truths of all is that we, we are our own other, own other living soul. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to face. Is it draining to do all this? I mean, these, as, as deep as they are each night? Is it cathartic? It's definitely cathartic. Um, although I don't want to be too indulgent with right. that. While I use my own landscape, I have a story to tell, I have a structure to keep, um, and I'm highly disciplined about that. It is a privilege. You know, I play a country, I play a continent. I, you know, I, I, I travel vast differences in ages and time and scope 
what other writer is going to ask that much of me? So it's a privilege to be asked and, um, and to be able to offer it. And you hope the audience takes away what? Oh, I don't know. I don't have any kind of great ambitions for this. But I am amazed, 25 years after his death, that it is selling out the West End. First time I've performed in New York, we're selling out BAM. Um, yeah. And it's with a young audience. And the fact that people seem, to be, thing, yeah, seem to be ready for Beckett today. I, I don't know why there's such a renewed appetite, but there's a real kind of urgency um, in, in terms of his, um, I don't know, ongoing appreciation. You had this amazing opportunity to meet Beckett's muse, Billy Whitelaw. That's right. Tell me about the relationship. Well, I first had to come to terms with the role myself, so I performed it in 2005 without meeting her, without seeing her performance, thank God. Otherwise, I would have tried to emulate her performance in some way, thus breaking Beckett's rule, mm. don't act. Mm. Um, I had to find my own access point. And then after I first performed it, Edward Beckett, the keeper of the estate, came along and said, I think you could meet Billy now, now that you've found your way. And we greeted each other like long-lost war veterans. She'd never played, or met anyone who played the role, and, and neither had I. Um, and about a year after that meeting, she rang me up out of the blue and she said, um, can you come round, please? I want to give you his notes. I need to give you his notes. I need to give him. Mm. And I fully expected her to take out a, an old rehearsal manuscript with his, mm. you know, scrape it, uh, or, or his writing on it. And uh, she said, sit down. And I sat at the kitchen table. And she said, begin. So I started the text. And she started conducting me. Da, 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 da. Just as Beck had had with her across her kitchen table. And she really, you know, she set me free with the piece. I think I'd been trying very diligently to, you know, adhere to his notes, no colour, don't act. And I was putting a sort of artificial monotone on his lean lines. And she blew all that out of the water. She said, what are you doing? He wants it all. He doesn't want an actor's craft, but he wants the guts. He wants the real stuff. He wants you. Mm. And the next thing, the whole piece started to sing. It's great to have you here. It's brilliant to be here. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you.